November 2nd, 1944. 16 P-51 Mustangs of the 352nd Fighter Group, the blue-nosed bastards of Bodney, drive deep into the heart of enemy territory. Captain Donald S. Bryan leads eight of the Mustangs, on course to link up with B-17s and herd them to a Nazi oil refinery in Meersburg, Germany. We were going into escort. Uh, we were on a penetration and we had not actually picked up the bombers. Before they reached the bombers, Brian and his squadron mates stumble upon a massive formation of 50 German fighters below them. Undeterred by the three to one odds, Don Brian positions his flight behind the enemy. You get into the middle of them and go fast enough so they don't get you and shoot the bastards down. The war cry of eight Rolls-Royce Merlin engines pierces the sky. You threw everything forward on the thing because you wanted the maximum power. And then usually you would start chopping back on it, slowing up as you approached it. Incredibly, the Mustangs bore in undetected. Brian singles out a 109, shredding the enemy fighter before it even has a chance to react. You could see the coolant flopping out of it. I mean, it was streaming white. Brian pulls up from his attack run. The Mustang's strike works. The 109s scatter. That's what we were after, is to break them up. And from then on, until the very last, it was just a mix of airplanes everywhere. And not too dang many 51s. <laughs> Don Bryan latches on to the tail of another 109, expertly balancing his stick and throttle. P-51D, I maintain, it was the most perfect airplane that ever was designed. Everything was exactly where you wanted it to be. You drop your left hand, it goes right to the flaps, into the trim controls, the throttle's just in the right place, the prop control's just perfect, the instruments are set up just right, and it's an airplane you can just sit and touch everything without even looking at it. Brian's finger is poised over the trigger. Suddenly, a frantic voice breaks over the radio. There's a bandit on Brian's six. He reacts with cool efficiency. All you do is just snap the stick into your gut and slam bottom rudder. And if you're at high speed, you just flick like that and you do it spin and it slows you up and then you pick up again. Brian's move ditches the German, but also the rest of his flight. They didn't snap roll with me, so they were, went off. But Brian catches sight of a target of opportunity. A flight of eight 109s flying in the direction of the bombers. Brian decides to target tail end Charlie. Brian is behind them, exactly where he wants to be. I'm going to pick the last one, always. Brian knocks the trailing 109 out, then quickly dodges away. Incredibly, another 109 appears off his nose. Brian quickly dispatches the bandit, his second kill in a span of seconds. When these things were so many, so fast, and I would say, okay, that guy is going down. And stop and look for something else. Brian dives back into the furball and latches onto a new target. But his lack of a wingman leaves him exposed. A sudden flash of metal in his rear view mirror. It's a 109 on his six o'clock. 
Brian breaks to the left. He rolls and reverses, but the German has sunk his teeth into the Mustang and won't let go. I had the hottest 51 in the air, and this guy was outperforming me. That's what really sweats you off. This Luftwaffe pilot is unlike any other he's encountered. Don Bryan's prowess in the P-51 Mustang is about to be put to the ultimate test. Speed defined the P-51 Mustang and the program under which it was developed. When the British Air Ministry proposed in April 1940 that North American Aviation open a new production line for RAF P-40s, North American instead offered an entirely new airframe and promised it in less time. Just 127 days later, the first Mustang prototype rolled out of the hangar. The fledgling fighter had the same 1,100 horsepower engine that equipped the P-40. But aerodynamically, it was radically different. Unlike a conventional airfoil, the cross-section of the Mustang's wing was thin at the leading edge and thicker toward the middle, with a similar curvature on both top and bottom. This innovative design reduced the buildup of air at the leading edge of the wing, called drag, and ensured laminar flow, the smooth flow of air over the wing contours at high speed. This helped boost the speed of the prototype to 382 miles per hour, faster than the P-40 and even the British Spitfire. Later models of the P-51 were wedded to the 1700 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, and the true potential of the Mustang was unleashed. The Rolls-Royce Merlin uh, is just got all kinds, it's got gobs of power to it. And when you kick the spurs into it, it really gets up and goes, especially going downhill. The definitive version of the Mustang, the P-51D, was armed with six 50 caliber machine guns and had a top speed of 437 miles per hour. The P-51 would outperform the normal 109 and the 190 at any altitude. Compared to the ME-109, Germany's most mass-produced fighter, the Mustang has almost every advantage. It is considerably faster, turns slightly better, and has greater range and a higher service ceiling. But now, Don Bryan is struggling to shake an ME-109 that is anything but normal. He can't outclimb the German, and his Mustang is on the verge of stalling. Now, up to that time, the 109s, we call them easy meat. And I'll be darned if this 109 outperformed me. Bryan tries to dive away. The 109 easily stays in trail. Talk about scaring you. The oxygen mask at 4 Gs was supposed to stay, but I had to hold it on because I was sweating and it was falling down on my chin. The German inches closer. He was out turning me as he was coming in and he finally got his guns on me. Like I say, not through me, but on me. And had he got him through, he'd have pulled the trigger and he got me. Brian summons a makeshift daredevil trick. He's only practiced a handful of times. You snap the stick into your gut, hit full bottom rudder, throw the stick full forward again, and then neutralize it. It's a death-defying maneuver he calls an inverted vertical reversement. Snapping the stick in tight stalls the aircraft. Ruddering down drops the nose. Incredibly, the torque of the propeller then twists the plane counterclockwise. Brian then pushes the stick full forward, neutralizing the effect. 
Only a supremely confident pilot would attempt such a bold move. Don Bryan buries the stick in his gut. Your head hits the canopy, and the prop twists you around. Your airspeed is down to nothing, and you fall for about 2,000 feet until you pick up flying speed again. In the meantime, you have disappeared from that guy that was onto you in a fraction of a second. With one ingenious move, Brian has escaped certain death. The Mustang plummets for an agonizing five seconds before its Hamilton standard propeller starts chopping through the air again. Brian has survived, barely. And Buster, I sure didn't go back after him. <laughs> but Brian doesn't break off to head for home. He is still in the middle of the frenzied melee. It was just airplanes everywhere. And Darn it, there were darn few friends around. <laughs> Below him, Brian spots one friend with some unwanted company. Brian is here. An ME-109 is here, chasing a squadron mate through the clouds below. Brian is desperate to save his friend. He rolls his Mustang over and dives to the rescue. November 2nd, 1944. Outnumbered and fighting for his own life, Mustang pilot Don Bryan is now diving to save a friend. With the altitude and speed advantage, the Mustang ace is poised to strike. In a dogfight, when you have two relatively equal aircraft, uh, the one with the most airspeed and altitude is at the advantage. Brian squeezes a burst. The surprised 109 pilot breaks off and dives. Brian pursues his mark into a cloud bank. The German fills his gun sight. The Mustang's six Brownings deliver a third kill for the day. Brian joins up with the other Mustang as his wingman, but enemy fighters are still in the area. Flying at 10,000 feet, Brian catches sight of two ME-109s flying the opposite direction 5,000 feet below. Only two of Brian's six guns remain loaded. I was running out of ammo, and finally, the last two airplanes, I was down to my inboards. But Brian is not about to let the 109s escape. He and his wingman split S, pulling out directly behind the Germans. Brian sends the trailing aircraft down in flames. He pours on the coal and closes on the leader. At just 80 yards, Brian squeezes the trigger. It looked like a whole section of his wing came off. He snapped into the clouds. I mean, it was a snap to the left, and uh, that's it. The Mustangs climb back to altitude and return to base. Of the 38 enemy planes claimed by Mustangs that day, Brian scored five. 
we got more doggone fun than the law allows. <laughs> Don Bryan is awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for the extraordinary mission. A mission deep inside of enemy territory that would not have been possible without another of the P-51's legendary attributes, its range. The Mustang's laminar flow wing and aerodynamic airframe reduced drag and boosted fuel efficiency. Over one quarter of the Mustang's 11,000 pound max takeoff weight was fuel, giving the P-51 a combat range of well over 1,400 miles twice that of other single-engine allied fighters. Gunther Rall, the third leading Luftwaffe ace, says that the P-51 was able to do for six hours what the 109 was able to do for 90 minutes. It was this amazing aircraft that could take off from a place like Duxford, England, go all the way to Berlin, do everything that it needed to do, and turn around and come back. While the Mustang made its name in Europe, it also saw service in the Pacific, where it was the only single-engine fighter with the stamina to escort bombers from Iwo Jima to the home island of Japan, a 1,300-mile round trip. Pilots called themselves the Tokyo Club. The benefits of membership, bad weather, exhaustion, flak, and enemy fighters, any one of which could kill. June 23, 1945, 9.38 a.m. Mustangs of the 47th Fighter Squadron take off from Iwo Jima. They're on a very long-range mission to strafe an air base north of Tokyo, helping to eliminate the threat of air attack to American bomber groups. Lieutenant Robert Scamera flies element lead in a flight of four. We didn't have to be tight formation, but I flew pretty close for something to do to keep me awake, because I had trouble keeping awake. The thing that's exhausting about the Mustang is not that you're strapped in and it's too hot or it's uncomfortable, it's the noise. The noise is just absolutely wears you down. Once over the mainland, the monotony fades. The four Mustangs of Scamera's flight prepare for battle. We flew up and headed uh, west, expecting to find this airfield loaded with airplanes, and, and we were going to strafe them. But instead, they were airborne. Seven Japanese fighters are at 9 o'clock low. 17 more are at 7 o'clock high. And one of them is targeting Scamera. I see these tracers come by and pass my cockpit, and that's when I broke formation, which was a no-no. You don't break formation, but if somebody's shooting at me, <laughs> I was, I don't care what the regulation was, I was going to get out of there. Scamera and wingman John Scanlon break hard left as the sky erupts into a blazing curtain of tracer rounds. From there on, it was just a big dogfight, one plane after another. A zero appears off Scamera's nose. The P-51D is among the first aircraft equipped with a lead computing gun sight, the gyroscopic K-14. You're supposed to know the wingspan. You guessed 37 feet or whatever. You punch that in, and it was supposed to self-lead it. So all you do is put the dot on the plane. Scamera's gun sight makes it so a quick burst is all he needs. The wounded Zero limps from the fight. Then, Scamera spots two Japanese N1K fighters, nicknamed Georges, at 9 o'clock low. The N1K was the most advanced Japanese fighter, posing a real threat to any American in the sky. The George has harder hitting cannons, but the Mustang has the edge in speed and altitude.
Gamera wings over into a dive. The Mustangs bore into the attack. June 23rd, 1945. In the midst of a deadly furball, Lieutenant Bob Scamara and wingman John Scanlon are closing fast on a pair of Japanese George fighters. I said, if that situation happens, there's two planes, I'll head for the leader, you head for his uh, number two man. Well, I was getting, closing in on the leader, and he wasn't shooting at the, the wingman. Scamara unleashes a torrent of hot lead on the enemy wingman. He dove down and I took off after the, the leader. And I caught him in nothing flat and shot him down. Splash two for Scamara. His strategy is to strike fast and move often. I made short burst because one thing I didn't want to burn up my guns and the other thing I didn't have to because the Japanese planes weren't uh, armored and they were easy to shoot down. <laughs> there was no problem there. Scamara engages several more Japanese fighters, damaging three. Seemed like every place I pointed there was a Japanese plane. It just didn't take much maneuvering to, to get from one to the other. But suddenly, tracers streak over his canopy. A KI-84 Frank, the fastest fighter in the Japanese arsenal, is diving from six o'clock high. Scamara breaks hard left. The Frank pilot's mistake is going too fast. He overshoots, pulling up into a climb. Scamara reverses and pitches up, straining to put the pipper on target. I remember pulling up and here was that gun sight was down on my cowling and I couldn't get enough lead on him. So I, I practically stalled out. Scamara manages a short burst before he's forced to dive away. burning Japanese fighter plummets right past his nose. Splash three. Scamara scans the sky once more. I thought one Japanese plane was out ahead of me. As soon as he see me coming, he split ass over and dove to the ground. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I followed. Scamara dives after the lone Oscar, but he begins to worry about his fuel state. Well, I, I said, heck with him, and I said, let him go. And I pulled back up uh, using my airspeed to gain as much altitude as I could. After all the maneuvering, the other Americans are nowhere to be seen. Scamara is alone. Then he catches sight of something off his left wing. That's when I noticed Scanlon was still on my wing. I hadn't noticed that up till that time. Incredibly, Scamara's wingman has stuck with him through every twist and turn. Scamara decides to head to the rally point. And I put him out on mutual support, which you, you don't talk to, you wiggle your tail and away he goes and he flies about a quarter of a mile parallel to you. So he can watch my tail, I can watch his tail. They don't get far before Scamara spots trouble behind Scanlon. A zero, right on his tail. I, I turned toward him, and, but, but I couldn't make it. I yelled at him over the radio to do something. There's a Japanese plane coming down on your tail. But it's too late. The Zero's 20 millimeter cannons pummel Scanlon's wings. They burst into flames. He jettisoned his canopy and he bailed out because his cockpit must have been pretty hot by then. Scamara circles his wingman's parachute, shooting at any Japanese planes that come within gun range. But I kept firing at them, keeping them clear, and pretty soon four of my guns went blank. 
two of them were still firing, but that's two of them had maybe a hundred rounds more than the other four. There's nothing more he can do for his wingman. Scamara breaks off and heads for home. He lands back on Iwo Jima after eight hours and 17 minutes with six empty guns. Remarkably, his internal fuel tank still has 54 gallons of fuel. Scamara is credited with three kills and four damaged. Tragically, John Scanlon would not make it home alive. Maybe three years later, that I happened to notice this little article in the newspaper, two or three women that were acquitted of, of war crimes. And their war crime was uh, releasing Scanlon from the infirmary to a civilian mob that was demanding uh, them to release him to them. Well, they released him to him and they lynched him. And that's, that's how I found out what happened to him. I'd have gladly given him back their three victories just if I could have saved John, but uh, it didn't happen that way. The Mustang made a significant contribution to the Allied victory in the Pacific, sweeping the skies of most Japanese fighters that threatened American bombers. Meanwhile, in Europe, Mustang pilots were among the first to take on the Third Reich's most menacing wonder weapon, the jet fighter. April 7, 1945, a lone P-51 Mustang soars above a large formation of B-24 bombers, droning into the German heartland. The Mustang pilot, Lieutenant Richard Candelaria, is the first to arrive on station above the bombers. The rest of the squadron is lost in thick cloud cover below. I had gotten to the rendezvous point about three or four minutes before the, the rest of the squadron got there. They said we'll be there in two or three minutes. Candelaria keeps his eyes outside the cockpit, scanning the sky. The D-model Mustangs featured a bubble-type canopy that greatly improved visibility over previous models. With the D-model, you can look all over the place. You have great visibility because the radar of a Mustang is your eyes. At 7 o'clock low, the young lieutenant spots something. First, I saw what looked like specs getting bigger, and then I realized they were ME-262s because they were coming fast. I'd seen them before, I had chased them before, but had never been able to catch one. The ME-262 is the world's first operational jet fighter. It's a quantum leap in technology that points to the future of air combat. The 262 is over 100 miles per hour faster, more heavily armed, with a faster rate of climb. But the slower Mustang can outturn the 262, and it had a higher service ceiling, altitude, that Mustang pilots could convert to speed. The ME 262s are here, closing fast on the bombers. Candelaria is here a lone Mustang against two jets. The only thing I could do to stop them was to run head on into them. Candelaria wings over and dives. His Mustang accelerates past 450 miles per hour. Its Merlin engine howls. He barrels toward the enemy jets, head on. April 7, 1945, Lieutenant Richard Candelaria is diving head-on against a pair of German jets that threaten an American bomber stream. Candelaria angles for a shot, but the Germans surprise him. The rate of closure was really great, and uh, they did something that I didn't expect. They nosed down slightly, not a great deal, but slightly, but 
it threw me off because I couldn't line up on them. The Germans' move is simple but brilliant. Candelaria is already pushing his aircraft's limitations for negative G. If he forces the nose any lower, he will red out and lose control of his Mustang. The Germans are about to slip past him. Candelaria must do something. They were going to go below me, so at that point I still had my external tanks on them. So I jettisoned them, hoping that maybe I'd be able to hit them with a tank. The German jets break hard left to dodge, forcing them to change course away from the bombers. Candelaria has created a brief window in which he can reverse direction and go on the attack. They rolled over and did a split S. Altitude converts to airspeed. I came down, then pulled up. By that time, I had about 490, uh, maybe 500 miles an hour. Candelaria's split S positions him inside his enemy's turn. He's able to pull lead as the jets bank right toward the bombers. Candelaria squeezes the trigger. It looked like something sparkled right behind the cockpit and the right engine started to belch out smoke, black smoke. So I knew I'd hit it at least in the engine. The stricken jet dives beneath the clouds. Candelaria is uncertain if he's killed the 262, but he doesn't have time to think about it. As I start to level off, I saw something like a glowing tennis balls going by my right wing. My crew chief had put some little round mirrors on the top of the canopy, and when I looked up in the mirror, uh, I saw the, the nose right behind me. As Candelaria focused on the leader, the enemy wingman slid in on his six o'clock. I broke left, hard left, because the bombers were on my right. So if they were going to chase me, they'd be going away from the bombers. An explosive 30 millimeter cannon shell strikes Candelaria's right wing. The Mustang bucks, but he holds the turn. The German jet can't turn with the Mustang and quickly overshoots. So I just broke to the right to try to get on him and he was just going way too fast. The German jet effortlessly pulls beyond reach. It dives away from the fight. Candelaria is wounded, but far from broken. Outnumbered by the most advanced fighters of World War II, he and his Mustang have won the dogfight. The skies around him are quiet as he climbs back toward the B-24s, the calm before the storm. All of a sudden, out of this cloud bank, I saw a whole bunch of aircraft. And I looked down and I said, hot dog, look at all those black crosses. And then I thought to myself, well, dear Lord, I've been praying for enemy aircraft. I'd have preferred them in twosies and threesies, not all at once. Candelaria is here. He's got 15 German ME-109s below him, heading up toward the Liberators. Once again, Richard Candelaria is the only one that stands in their way. He throttles up, hurtling into the dogfight. The American targets the group leader. This one was yellow from the windscreen right to the nose, to the spinner. It was a bright yellow. This guy wanted to be seen. That should have given me a clue that he was probably a hot shot. Candelaria maneuvers for a shot. I was trying to pull lead on him. I found out that I wasn't going to be able to because in order to do that, I'd have been 
heading toward the bombers. Any stray round could hit a big friend. Candelaria can't risk it. He decides instead to pass underneath the German and reverse vertically, giving him an angle clear of friendly aircraft. I went underneath him. I went right on past underneath him under his left wing, came back up. Candelaria yanks the stick back. An excruciating 6G pull. The 109 opens up on the B-24s, lobbing cannon shells at long range. One of the engines on the closest bomber is blown out. I came back and started to get on his tail. That's when he started his maneuvering. The 109 dodges Candelaria. He was making a fool out of me. Every time I'd try to get the gun sight on him, he'd do something fancy and I'd go sailing past him to one side or the other. The other 109s hang back, allowing their skilled leader to dispatch the American. The lethal ballet continues. The 109 pulls left and begins a tight loop. He rolled over on his back, and I was just under him, and we started turning, trying to outturn each other, and I could look up and see him, and he could look down and see me. The skilled German is outflying the American. If Candelaria can't turn the tables quickly, he will surely die. April 7, 1945. Lieutenant Richard Candelaria has a hot shot German on his tail. The Mustang pilot will chance a risky maneuver in an attempt to turn the tables. Candelaria will chop his power and kick hard rudder to swing the P-51's nose around directly onto the 109's tail. If Candelaria stalls, he will fall out of the sky, becoming an easy mark for his enemy. They pulled back as hard as I could, just above the stall. As I did that, I loosened the pressure and kicked the rudder, and the 51 just slid around almost behind him. Candelaria skids past the German. I was not able to track him. The gun sight was a little too slow, so I just winged it, you might say. I just figured that's where he's going to be, and I squeezed the trigger. When he started belching out smoke, he went barreling down. I went down after him. Then I saw him bail out canopy came off and he went into the woods and crashed. It's a hard-fought victory, but the leaderless pack of 109s is now out for revenge. As Candelaria levels off, tracers engulf his canopy. A 109 is coming in fast. Candelaria skids his Mustang to the left. The German overshoots. Candelaria noses back to the right. A few solid hits convince the German pilot to bail. I broke off almost immediately because there was somebody else behind me. The remaining 109s form up into a loose Lufbury circle a defensive ring that virtually ensures mutual protection. But Candelaria refuses to break off. His strategy is to slash through the circle, hoping to knock down an enemy plane before one can get a shot on him. I kept going into that Lufbury tighter and tighter until I got a chance to shoot one more time. A 
another 109 down. But immediately, there's a new threat on his six. Candelaria breaks hard right. The German follows him. There was no doubt I was out turning him, and we were in a very tight uh, turn to the right. And the 109 had a tendency to not do too well to the right. Candelaria is slowly out turning his enemy, but the German does not break away. After several rotations, Candelaria gets a firing angle. His six Brownings bark to life. He just sort of stamped and went into the ground and cartwheel across the ground. They pulled hard to the right and then to the left uh, to avoid anyone else. Just then, Candelaria's Mustang squadron mates finally show. The remaining Germans break off and head for the clouds. Richard Candelaria single-handedly scored four confirmed victories against the 109s and a probable jet kill against the ME-262. Coming home, sort of the, the last hundred miles, I noticed my knees were, were shaking. And I don't know whether it was a adrenaline or what, but my knees were shaking. I realized, boy, that was close. That was a little too close. Men like Richard Candelaria made the P-51 one of the most successful fighters in the history of air combat. In Europe alone, the Mustang accounted for 4,950 enemy aircraft, making it the highest scoring U.S. fighter in the theater. The Mustang is an icon of World War II, but today, its legend lives on at air shows and air races throughout the world. I'm so fortunate to be able, as a civilian, fly with these guys in the Heritage Flight Program for the Air Force, where we take the Mustang and we fly it with the Raptor and the A-10 and the F-15 and the F-16. Without a doubt, if you ask those guys, if you go and fly one aircraft, they all want to get in the Mustang. It's just the legend of it. It's the ultimate airplane for those guys. The Mustang remains a true classic, a lethal fighting machine of sculpted beauty and an enduring symbol of American air power.